all, thank you very much for coming today. As you see in the first uh, slide, um, we have a Slido code to join in us. You have the code QR if you want to use your phones to join the Slido uh, platform. And there is just a very short question at the beginning is just to know who is attending because we had more than 400 registrations and uh, now you are a little bit more than 200. So we would like to know who is there to engage discussion during the panel discussion later. So I would like to introduce, so I'm Anna Granados, the director of EFAF and the secretary general of Faber TP. And I would like to introduce you the team. Um, so Chala, you will be your moderator later in the panel discussion. And we have Miriam, Duru, Barbara, and Isabella uh, working in the backstage to make this uh, webinar uh, possible. So uh, uh, yeah, before starting uh, with the speakers, just a brief introduction of FF and Faber TP. So uh, FF is the voice of more than 40 breeding cooperatives, associations, and companies engaged in the animal breeding and reproduction sector. You can, uh, you can see them here. And the Faber TP uh, is a technology platform with Research Institute membership and also uh, the, FAF, the FF uh, members. The, uh, the, the aim of Faber TP is to engage collaboration, to strengthen collaboration with, within the private sector and the public sector, and to show the importance of research in this in the sector of animal breeding and reproduction. FF is also involved in European projects, mainly in European projects. Uh, we have uh, new, uh, four new projects starting in 2021. We are a knowledge provider and uh, we uh, are active in dissemination of results most of the time with these projects. So just to, let me explain a little bit if you were not attending the first webinar. The aim of this series of the webinars is to um, engage conversation with the stakeholders and um, policymakers, and also with the breeding and the research uh, sector around the pillars of code FAR. Code FAR is a voluntary code of practice uh, for balanced and responsible farm animal breeding. And this series of webinars will focus on the uh, main pillars of uh, of the code. You have more information in the in, uh, in in our website. Of course, today it's about animal health and welfare pillar. So, just uh, for your convenience, uh, yeah, if you have not the right name in your image, uh, write your organization name uh, with your first name and surname. So. Um, Turn off your camera and microphone. We will have speakers later uh, attending. I mean, during, you can uh, uh, open it also later, don't worry, but uh, um, that's uh, for a good, uh, we will like to see you. It is not a webinar in which we are not seeing uh, the participants, but uh, if uh, you are not experiencing uh, the webinar in the right way, perhaps it's your camera that is uh, checking a lot of place. Uh, so you have any technical issues, just to write in the chat or contact Duru by email. So duru.eruglu, um, she will be uh, available for this. And note, please, that the webinar will be recorded and we will share it through social media and in our website. This time, for this second webinar, we are engaging also with you a little bit more with the Slido. So we will have uh, questions during the webinar. And please, for the questions to the speakers and to engage during the panel discussion, uh, use the chat. Don't worry, Chala will take care of all of your questions. So yeah, um, that is uh, uh, the house rules. And that this is a program that you already know because you have a register to hear about this. Uh, we'd like to introduce the first speaker, Christian Julison. Christian, you can now unmute, please. So Christian is working yeah. in DigiSante at the European Commission. 
and animal welfare and antimicrobial resistance. He's a lawyer with experience in the, at the European Parliament, and uh, he has been working with matters related to food safety and animal health and welfare for many years. Now he's a responsible person for, from the Commission on the evaluation of animal welfare legislation, what they call the fitness check, and the revision of the animal welfare legislation and the farm to fork strategy. So Christian, um, I cannot see you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. You should be able to share yours. If it's not happening, let us know and we will help you. Thank you. And thank you for this opportunity to briefly outline, yes, indeed, the uh, animal welfare and health actions under the form of the folk strategy. I will try to share my screen. Which doesn't, doesn't allow me to. Okay, I'll try this then. Now, can you see my slides? Yes. Yes. You can. Okay. We can. So, thank you so much. Again, a brief outline then of the animal health and welfare actions under the Farm to Fork strategy. And to stop by putting those actions into context, as you may be aware, EU has adopted a green deal to make our continent the first uh, climate neutral. Sorry, sorry yes? to interrupt you. Can you put in presentation mode? Ah. We see all the slides, but we cannot strange. see. No. Ah, because I can see only. Okay, let's. Okay, well, let's try this then. Presentation mode, but okay. I think you so stopped sharing now. So I, th I think you have to share your screen again. Yeah, you have to start yeah. again to share the screen. Thanks, Miriam. I'm on mute. Okay. I'll try to share again uh, my. Hmm. We're not seeing anything yet. Then let's try this. I'll try to share my screen again. No, it doesn't allow me to share my screens anymore. Um, Do you have this button, this green button saying share screen? Yeah, we, you're, you're, oh yeah. we see now, your screen now, but we don't see the presentation. Yeah, but not the presentations. And now, uh, still seeing the same? You don't see my screen, my presentation. No, we see your screen, but not the presentation. We see your um, Zoom uh, meeting view. So okay. I think maybe you're working with two screens and you're sharing the wrong... No, I usually not. I usually, not not now. That's very embarrassing. Uh, okay, let's see if I can. Hmm. Because it doesn't allow me to share. Okay, I'll stop the sharing. I'll try again. It doesn't allow me to share my entire screen for some reason. It only allows me to share my application window, which doesn't help at all. Uh, Christian, what you should do, you yes. should first go on your, uh, on your presentation. And yes. Do that. Then you go to the Zoom. And then on the bottom, you have the green. And then you to share screen and then your presentation comes up and then you can do it on the presentation mode, I think. Okay, that's what I try to do, but still it doesn't... Christian, would you like do. that we yeah. share your presentation for you? Yes, if you wouldn't mind. Yes, thank you, Baba. That's great. That might be the best option. I'll stop sharing then. There's a lot of background noise. Ah, can you now see this, the slides? Yeah, now perfect. it's perfect. Ah, thank you so much. Sorry for this. Let's start again. So a very brief outline indeed of the actions on our health and welfare under Form to Fork. And as mentioned, this is in the context of the Green Deal and the Form to Fork strategy itself is in the heart of that Green Deal. And a very cornerstone of that strategy, if you click please, is indeed animal health and welfare. It comes from this quote from the strategy and from other angles, we have the council conclusions, for instance, from October last year, putting animal health and welfare in the center of this strategy. Next slide, please. And clearly a well-managed, well-treated livestock and a healthy one contributes a great deal to sustainability in the full sense, economically, environmentally, and socially. And looking on a global scale, it represents an important income 
not least for women in many poor countries. It provides well-needed nutrition, not least for children in need. And it also helps to reduce emissions. In other words, saving the climate. If we then move to the topic of today, breeding. Next slide, please. As shown by this quote from the European Parliament's Research Service, breeding can contribute not only to efficiency, but also reduced emissions. So economically, environmentally beneficial. And also, as we learn more about today, I imagine, also it can help to fight AMR, antimicrobial resistance, by making the animals more disease resistant. But breeding as a technology, breeding is a tool, like a hammer is a tool. And you can use your hammer to build a fantastic terrace, or you can use your hammer to kill your neighbor. It's really about how you choose to use the tool, the technology hand. And as we also know, if used to create rapid growth of the animals or a highly specialized selection of animals or the breeds, they may have negative impacts on animal welfare. And just to elaborate a little bit more on that, next slide, please. EFSA, European Food Safety Authority in 2010, and now we focus on the example of broilers, came with this scientific opinion, which was followed by the commission report in 2016 that you also see quoted on the screen. And in both cases, you see, it's a very multifaceted issue, animal welfare. Interaction with management factors, multiple factors, environmental, genetic, it's all interlinked, it's multifaceted. We need a holistic approach, and that is indeed what the Farm to Fork strategy offers. So coming then to the topic of and welfare actions under the form strategy. There are many actions and many objectives in this quite ambitious strategy. As you may know, one objective is to reduce uh, the sales of antimicrobials for use of veterinary medicine purpose in, in farming and aquaculture by 50% until 2030. There's a push to increase to 25% of farmland to become organic, and there's also an increase in organics in aquaculture among the objectives. But if you focus on welfare per se, the most tangible, most concrete action is what you see on the screen now, is the revision of the whole acquis, the whole set of legislation currently on farming animals, uh, including transport and slaughter, and the mandate is quite clear. It follows from the text of the strategy, it should be done to align it with latest science, have a broader scope, make it easy to enforce, and of course, improve animal welfare. In addition, if you want to click, please, there's another action as well to consider the option for welfare labeling. I will not endeavor too much on those today, but this is also part of the package uh, under the for strategy. What I would what I'd like to do though, is just to emphasize the role of science. Yes, we can move with it, doesn't matter. But just to emphasize the role of science, so clearly, I think we all agree, we need legislation to be science-based, but we also, as much need a legislation which is adaptable easily in the light of new science. So in other words, making the legislation future proof, that is the objective. And the first step has been taken and is what you see on the screen now, the fitness check. And those pieces of legislation listed, those are the core package, if you like, the general farming directive, the broilers, the pigs, etc. These are the core act, uh, legal acts to be assessed in light of a bigger picture, which includes, for instance, the rules on industrial emissions. So a greater picture on this. It's a fitness check. It's more than a classical evaluation. In a sense, it's been much, it's much more forward looking. The next slide, please, uh, will explain a bit more. So the purpose is to really see, are these existing rules today fit for the needs of tomorrow? And as a follow up question, if we need to do something, what do we need to do to align these objectives of welfare to the sustainability goals of the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy? And that's the big task at hand and in the coming years. And indeed, yes, and indeed, currently we are in the fitness check. And as you see, it will draw from numerous sources, including new scientific evidence provided by EFSA, uh, and different audits, pilot projects, studies, and most important or not least uh, less important thorough consultation of stakeholders concerned it will as you see at the arrows at the bottom of the page this year and early next amount to a global picture 
of the fitness of the current acquis, which will then lead to step two, which is indeed by 2023 proposed revised legislation. Again, to be future proof and science based. And just to reassure you, if need be, nothing will be proposed before uh, without a proper impact assessment as, as usual. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, thanks for uh, telling us and explaining that the purpose of the commission is to make legislation. Yeah, Anne-Marie, thanks. But I have to introduce you too. <laughs> well, uh, so thank you very much, Christian, again. And uh, yeah, I, I forgot to say that, uh, well, you know that Harvard TP is engaged in research. So these uh, webinars are also focus on science, given a strong position on science. To I was mute, I'm sorry. So yeah, Anne-Marie, I'm going to skip your presentation or your, the slide with your name and your presentation. Uh, I think you don't, you don't need to, to, to be introduced. Anne-Marie has been uh, at my place uh, so yeah, some years ago. Now she's working in Aviagen. She's a, a group vice president welfare and compliance since May 2011. Uh, and that is include welfare, but also sustainability. Uh, so I'm sorry, uh, can you mute uh, Sonia, please? We can, thank you very much. Uh, so, Anne-Marie, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us today, and I give you the floor. I think you can unmute yourself, so uh, yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Anna, for uh, this opportunity to give a presentation on balanced breeding for welfare and sustainability in poultry. So, Aviagen has a history since the 1970s of breeding with ever-increasing focus on animal welfare and sustainability. Our broad breed portfolio comes from crossbred populations, typically four pedigree lines. And on the bottom of the figure, you see our large gene pool, baselines and development and non-selected control lines. From these baselines stem the birds of our great and grandparent generations. It takes around four years from pedigree to broiler generation performance and welfare improved birds and high health. This is ongoing. Very important is that trends and requirements from customers and society are taken on board. As you can see here on the left. At Aviagen, bird welfare is a cornerstone of sustainability. If I were to name what I feel to be the most important contribution to sustainable meat production, it would be animal welfare. Healthy animals are more resistant to disease. Their livability is strong and they perform better. This is also good for the environment and the economic sustainability of farmers. At Aviagen, we have, been def have defined where we, as a breeding company, can make a difference as our top five commitments. Our first commitment is around health and food security, securing a safe, secure supply of healthy birds to help feed a growing global population. Second, come out of diverse lines, our major assets and what we breed from. Third comes our balanced breeding program. Our fourth commitment is around the importance of management and stockmanship of the improved populations. The fifth commitment is around transparency, communication and engagement. And we are following Code FMR the code of good practice for sustainable and responsible animal breeding. The members of the International Poultry Council, the global association representing meat poultry, have defined where the meat poultry sector can make a difference for sustainability. From the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, they prioritized where meat poultry can make the most difference as the top five SDGs. These are SDGs two, no hunger, three, good health and well-being, four, quality education, nine, industry, innovation and infrastructure from and with good health and welfare, 
and 13, the climate, where poultry impacts positively on our global footprints. A joint declaration was signed with the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization in Sao Paulo. Since January 2020, the major theme of Aviagen is green sustainability, and we have aligned the Aviagen Top 5 commitments and IPC priorities. A primary breeder works at the top of the food chain. So our first commitment is ensuring a safe and secure supply of healthy birds. The birds we multiply are free from avian influenza, Newcastle disease, leucosis, all salmonella, and all mycoplasmas. To ensure they are robust, we raise brothers and sisters of our pedigrees under commercial conditions and use the robustness outcomes in the selection. We have breeding programs on two continents and high generation operations across the world. Several avian operations across the world have compartmentalization status. Our breeding programs have nearly two decades of being free of antibiotics. With our major assets, the diversity of the poultry lines, which are the basis we breed from, it is our responsibility to ensure there is poultry available for the future and to provide a choice of conventional and slower growing breeds, all focused on welfare. We operate balanced breeding programs. We improve health, welfare, production, and the environmental impact all at the same time, already for decades, with huge and continuing innovations and investment. We continue to simultaneously select for a large number of production health and welfare traits through balanced breeding. Through innovative technology for robust birds and adaptability for both conventional and slower growing breeds, at least one third of our selection focus is on health and welfare traits. And this presentation is an example of Aviagen, but all poultry breeding companies select for many traits at the same time. Thank you, Christian Julison, for referring to the EFSA 2010 remark that the major welfare outcomes concerns have a genetic basis and may interact with management factors to lead to poor welfare, including skeletal disorders, contact dermatitis, ascites, and sudden death syndrome. That is a heart issue. Most of these are linked with fast growth rates. That's the quote. Indeed, with unbalanced breeding, this may be the case. Since then, since 2010, the Farm Animal Welfare Council breeding report of 2012 and the European Commission report by Himster and Ternapel of 2013, of which you can see the front uh, uh, on the slide, the blue report, confirm that our breeding goals have for decades included traits on skeletal, leg and foot health, heart function, livability. This information is now also available from peer-reviewed literature. And through the ever-increasing use of advanced medical imaging, as well as gate scoring, and you can see these on the right, gate scoring in the middle and these images on the bottom, we have and continue to deliver demonstrably significant welfare improvements. We have a long-standing commitment to improve welfare. For decades, we deliver, deliver animal welfare improvements at the same time as better health, environmental sustainability, and global food security. As the diagram shows, with the improvement of production traits, we are also improve, able to improve the welfare traits. You can see from these data from our pedigree program between 2005 and 2019 that with balanced breeding, both leg health and body weight have improved simultaneously. They have improved to such an extent that the birds with the best welfare in 2005 have far worse welfare than the birds with the worst welfare in 2019. The results on other health and welfare traits are published in articles from my colleague Santiago Avendaño and confirmed also with publicly available data for instance, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. It means 
that a tremendous improvement in welfare has been realized between 2005 and 2019, along with production improvements. That is balanced breeding. These welfare improvements will continue breeding forward. Balanced breeding means simultaneous improvement of not only welfare and production, but also environmental impact. The carbon footprint has lowered, as this graph shows you. This is a result of the feed conversion weight improvements. All breeding improvements add up. The gain of this year comes on top of the achievement of last year and so on. The world changes and our breeds improve. Breeding improvements are permanent and add up generation on generation. But at the fork level itself, in the barn, 70 to 90 percent of the health, welfare and performance are influenced by management factors. We invest a lot in management support and education, new management materials, schools, and our fifth commitment is on engagement, transparency and communication. We aim to be transparent in publishing in, for instance, peer review journals, trade publications on our website and communicate about what we do. We actively engage at various levels via our customers and associations with a wider society. It is important we enter the dialogue, explain what we do and show how we are committed to breeding welfare and sustainability. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. I see that the chat is ongoing, so don't hesitate to share your questions to speakers. Um, I'm going to give the floor now uh, to Steffi, Stephanie Nuhaus from Topics Norway. Uh, Steffi, can you hear us and can you unmute yourself? I can hear you, yes. Okay, good. So uh, Steffi is uh, working, uh, sorry, I had the alarm from uh, Anne-Marie. Uh, she stopped uh, working in Topics Norwin. She's participating in a um, um, research program called Imagine uh, with Wageningen University. She has studied the uh, University for Applied Science in Soest. She has been working in different farms in Germany, Canada and Norway. And uh, she, at the beginning, she was focusing her career in plant breeding. Now, again, as I told you, she's working in Topics Norwin and she's going to make a very interesting presentation on breeding on behavior. So, Steffi, can you share your screen? I have to stop sharing mine, but I think that you can already share yours. If it's not the case, we can take this role from here. Yeah. That'll work. It's perfect, Steffi. Go ahead. Okay, thanks for the invitation. I'm very glad that I can give a presentation here about breeding at Topics Northby. No, it doesn't change the slide on my computer. The disclaimer beginning. So let me please start with the point of view of breeding. We do have our nucleus farms all over the world with all our different lines and our two boar stations, Delta Norway and Delta Canada, where all our boars get CT scans. And then we do have the second level and that is the multiplayer level that are farms all over the world and they do have the land race, the North Bean land race, or the set line, the large white, on the farms and they inseminate and produce this way the TN70, the F1. That is a parent cell and that is usually the parent cell we do have on a normal production farm in Europe. Uh, 
the farmers of this production farm can use or can choose a perfect terminal, terminal fire line. You can see them here on the right side. Uh, it could be a Duroc, uh, can be a Select, TN Select, which is a Pietra, or can be a Tayan Temple, which is a kind of large white and vital and fast growing robust terminal bore, depending on the market. And with this together, we produce the finishing ticks. You can see them here on the bottom of the paramite, and that are mainly the animals we are talking about when we talk about social ticks. We start with a parent cell, the F1 selection. That is something we do, for example, on the German market. On all our multiplier farms, we have technicians going to the farms and select the animals for our clients. And when we do that, we see following. You see on the left side are animals in one pen, and all these animals have a horde on the back, which means these animals behave very good in a group. They like to be together, they are friendly to each other, and they just behave perfectly in a group. On the right side, you see animals, some with a horde on the top, which means the animals are still friendly and good, but you can see some animals with a red cross on the top, which means they do have some skin lesions or some damage. And you see also one pig with a lightning on top, which means these animal might be the reason why the other animals have a red cross, why the animal has a skin damage. So what we assume is that we do have some animals which behave very good in a group and are very social and don't like to bite and don't like to get bitten. We might have some animals who tend to be a victim and we might have some animals who tend to be the performer. And maybe it could be also possible that we do have some animals which can have skin lesions, so can be a victim. And at the same time, they can be a performer as well. So what we did is we got some data or took some data from Germany. So we select all the animals before we sell them to the client. And if we can't sell them to a client, we give them a reason and say, okay, we can't cause of, for example, skin lesion. So, and in the past, we have around about 5% of the animals we can't sell cause of this damage. We took this data and at the end, we had over 60,000 animals and over 6,000 pens and could figure out by genetic modeling that there might be a direct or indirect effect of these animals, being victim or being performer. And that is a really important part because these animals or these cells are the further generation of the cells we sell to our clients and which are in the production system. And these group cells have to stay in a group in gestation on European cell farms. Then we take the next step, we want to go to the piglets. And there, here I use the slogan from nose to tail. And it, actually it is stolen from the butcher for the slaughter industry because actually it means you use a whole pig for consumption. But in this case, I think it fits perfectly because we always look at the tail and say, hey, we do have some issues, but the issue is actually between the nose and the tail and not just at the tail. And what you can see here, I will show you some pictures on the right side. Uh, that is an acrosis on a five days old piglet. I'm pretty sure this one is not done by pen mates, and I'm pretty sure it, it's not because of the holding system. I think uh, it is, yeah, the reasons are in an earlier stage, already in gestation. Here you can see, uh, I think it's 25 or 28 kilogram heavy piglets, and you can see some necrosis on the ear tips. And here's another animal, about 50 kilogram, and here you can see the necrosis on the ear ground. And that is an older sow, and here you can see some skin damage at the tear tip. And here you can see some necrosis on the body, on a flank, I think it is flank. Here yeah, we are pretty sure it's no social behavior. This has physical reasons, but it is a damage and it causes pain and it can trigger tail and ear baiting behavior. So what we do now is that we have several observations on production nucleus farms. There we score necrosis um, a few days after birth at rearing and at finishing so that we score that on different ages and different stages. And also to follow up if necrosis in early life can 
lead to more necrosis or tail issues or wounds in, in uh, later life. So we scored already over 3,000 piglets in detail, and we can say that we see a genetic and env environmental effect or variants. The next step are the finishing pigs. That is a barn we have in Gronau in Germany. It's a project together with the University of Wageningen. It's called Imagen, the project, and it's together with some other partners from the industry. On this farm, we do have 200 finishing pigs, and they are in pens with 11 animals, and they do have an ISOC feeding station for individual feeding data, and they have also climate boxes. And here you can see some pictures that is from the test run. You see the camera and uh, yep, the test system, and that is how it looks today. So in total, we have eight cameras above the pens, like I said, 11 animals inside. And the special thing is that all these animals have an electronic ear tag. It means every time they go to the IFOC feeding station, the feeding station has an antenna, reads the, IFOC, uh, reads the electronic ear tag, and we can identify the animal. And the first goal of this project is to develop a track and tracing system for individual pig level. So it means that we can follow up every single animal. And the second goal is that we train a system to measure the social behavior. So both works with artificial intelligence. And here you can see the camera. And both works with artificial intelligence and is to measure social behavior. And that's all very objective and that 24 hours a day and seven days a week. You can see a uh, video. I hope you all can see that. Uh, that was one of the test run that are Durox animals in the pen. And you can see that you have a colored box around each animal so that we can follow up every single animal, where it is in the pen, where it is located. And on long term, we would like also to measure the social behavior. For example, you can see right now that they compete a little bit about feed at the feeding station. And it is a plan to improve this and to implement that on the nucleus stage. And then comes the next step, and that is a slaughter plan. That is a system made by a CLK technique in Altenberge together with the Tiho Hannover. They made it. It's so called the peak inspector. Um, that is uh, pretty much the same we do on the finishing farm. They implemented or installed some cameras at the slaughter line. And all animals passing by these camera techniques, they take some pictures of the carcasses and do an object objective evaluation of skin lesions and intactness of the tails and ears. They also using a camera technique and artificial intelligence. And the good thing is it is a kind of routinely measurement at the slaughter line. The scoring system for that needs to be evaluated, that is for sure. But the good thing for us as a breeding company is that we are using electronic ear tech for our animals. So means that we can connect the electronic ear tech with the slaughter hawk. And therefore, we do have the connection between animal and slaughter data. So let me say one thing to the end. We have to see the whole picture. It is a big puzzle and it is, has multiple factors which can infect the social behaviors of these animals. And for us, I think it's very important to see the big picture from the nose to the tail. So what is between the tail and the nose and what is actually causing these issues? The second picture we have to see is that we see the whole production line, the whole pyramid and uh, our breeding goal. At the same time, the whole production system from the sow over the piglet, the finishing pig, and the slaughter pig. And let me see one thing very, let me say one thing very clear. We might be able to improve our genetics, but we will never be able to breed just for happy pigs. Because therefore, you have to see the whole puzzle and you have to see every puzzle part. You have to see the management water, how the system helps feeding and climate. and if we just improve every single part, then we do have a good chance to get a sustainable future. And therefore, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, then please don't hesitate to contact me. 
Thank you very much, Sefi. Um, yeah, we have a small issue with uh, people reconnecting. Uh, there is a lot of people in the waiting room. Miriam, can I give you the floor? Um, yes, I think we're experiencing some problems because there are a lot of people joining. Um, yeah. We're trying to fix it, but it might be that everyone has to be a little bit patient. Yes, and the issue is that uh, there is a lot of times the same name. So, um, yep, uh, we are going to reach the, the, the maximum of 500 people. So, uh, yeah, I, I hope uh, that there was some issues also to, to see the slides of Steffi uh, from some of you. So I hope it's going to go better uh, with the next uh, presentation from Trina. I'm going to share this, my screen again and uh, introduce you the next speaker. I will try to go slowly to allow um, people to, 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 so, to see it. So Trina Galloway is um, the man, manager of external relations and CSRR in Aquagen. Aquagen is located in Norway, so close to Europe and a little bit outside. Um, uh, she has a PhD in aquaculture, in aquaculture, because this is one of the sectors that FF is involved to. It's not about pigs and poultry, but also it's not only, but also aquaculture and ruminants. So Trina has worked in applied aquacultural research since graduating, first in the feed sector, and then in the resource technology sector, and now as Aquagen Manager of External Relations as ESR. So uh, Trina, I hope uh, you can unmute yourself. That is not the case, we are going to give you- Can you hear me? I'm, then yes. I'm unmuted, yes. <laughs> I have stopped sharing my screen, so you will, should be able to share yours. Okay, let's see what happens. Um, should be this one. Yeah, this is very, yeah, uh, yeah there are some of the you people see still seeing this. Un yeah, yeah, just a second, uh, uh, Trina. Uh, there are some of the people still seeing Anne-Marie's screen. Anne-Marie, uh, can you perhaps, um, yeah, I don't know if your camera is still working. Perhaps you can switch off and be sure that your presentation, I don't know, I don't know why, but uh, some of the people is still. Uh, okay, Trina, screen is good. Okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I <laughs> guess we are a lot of people and uh, some of them can have an issue. Okay, okay. so yes. Yeah. Thank you, Trina, yeah. Well, thank you for the, the introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my given topic uh, today is reducing the use of antibiotics through salmonid uh, breeding. But um, the fact is that antibiotics usage in uh, the Norwegian fish farming industry is not really a problem today. So I'll show you what I mean later uh, and also give some examples of how Aquagen works with uh, salmonid diseases. Let's see, does it go forward? Let's see. Yeah. So uh, first, I would like to uh, just briefly introduce the salmon farming industry uh, for those who don't know it very well. The the salmonids are uh, farmed globally, uh, almost 3.8 million tons, uh, of which uh, th uh, two and a half uh, million tons are Atlantic salmon. Um, in Norway alone, the salmonid production is uh, about 1.4 million tons in uh, 2019, of which 1.3 million was Atlantic salmon. And the map shows that uh, in some regions, um, uh, more salmonids are harvested than, the, than is required in the region, and therefore it is exported to other regions. But in other regions, uh, they harvest less than they need and therefore import from the other regions. Um, in Norway today, we uh, harvest uh, uh, four times more, or produce more, four times more fish than land animals. Um, 
shortly about Aquagen and our breeding uh, programs. Uh, uh, Aquagen develops, produces and delivers genetic material to the global aquaculture industry. Uh, we have uh, breeding programs for Atlantic salmon, uh, rainbow trout, Pacific salmon and lumpfish. We uh, deliver fertilized uh, eggs from pr production facilities in Norway, Scotland and Chile to customers all over the world. And this year it is 50 years since uh, we started uh, the first collection of salmon and rainbow trout from 40 different uh, Norwegian rivers as marked on the map here. Um, Aquagen has a balanced selection uh, breeding program uh, for more than 20 traits uh, in the salmon breeding program, uh, which are most of them are shown here. Um, so we, we select for all these things at the same time, as uh, Anna-Marie mentioned for the poultry. Uh, growth in uh, seawater has been the most important trait since the onset of the breeding program in the early 1970s. Uh, first by family selection and then recently also by genomic selection. Um, we started selecting for growth in freshwater uh, in uh, 2001. Uh, and uh, breeding for uh, disease resistance started in the 1990s uh, when Aquagen uh, selected for, for um, uh, or resistance against the bacterial disease Ferunculosis and the viral disease uh, infectious salmon anemia or ISA. Um, we later stopped this uh, selection because um, good vaccines were developed for Ferunculosis and ISA was uh, handled by stamping out. Um, it was only through introduction of a powerful genetic marker or QTL uh, for resistance to the viral disease infectious pancreas necrosis or IPN in 2009 uh, that selection for disease resistance had a measurable effect on the aquaculture industry. Um, resistance, uh, uh, the, so the most re recent traits in the salmon breeding program are resistance to other uh, viral diseases such as pancreas disease, um, cardiomyopathy syndrome and uh, heart and skeletal muscle, muscle inflammation uh, by marker assisted selection and also uh, resistance to lice, uh, salmon lice by genomic selection. So I will show you now some uh, examples of the effects of Aquagen's uh, breeding program on the salmon industry. Uh, reduced time in the sea reduces the risk of exposure to many diseases that are troublesome in the salmon farming. Selective breeding for increased growth in the sea is one of the most important reasons why the total production time has decreased since the onset of salmon farming. On average, there has been a 300 gram improvement per generation and the genetic potential um, of today's salmon enables the farmers to produce a four to five kilo salmon in 12 months at sea compared to 22 months uh, in the first generation. And over time, this reduces the turnover time, uh, time and gives a better utilization of the infrastructure and the licenses available. And such a development has a major positive effect on the environmental and economic sustainability of salmon production, as more salmon can be produced with fewer resources. As earlier mentioned, antibiotics uh, usage in Norwegian fish farming is not a big problem, and there is currently no animal production uh, that uses less antibiotics. The figure shows that in the 1980s, antibiotics usage was high in the Norwegian salmon farming uh, due to big problems with bacterial diseases uh, such as cold water vibriosis and pharyngulosis. Uh, the, the, that's the blue line you see there. The solution was the development of good vaccines. Um, and since 1995, around 200 kilos of antibiotics has been used totally in the Norwegian fish farming industry per year, at the same time as the production of fish has increased sevenfold, up to around 1.4 million. 
Um, so it's a very, very low antibiotics usage. In other uh, salmon producing countries, however, uh, such as Chile and the UK, bacterial diseases are a problem. Um, one example is the salmon rickettsial septicemia, or the SRS in Chile, where many uh, vaccines have been developed, but none give a full protection. Uh, this disease gives huge losses in the production and is the main reason for high antibiotics use in Chile. Uh, Aquagen has found a strong QTL for SRS uh, and marker-assisted selection for SRS resistance gives a higher survival of the salmon and less use of antibiotics. Uh, in this figure, we uh, see the difference uh, how the antibiotics used is reduced with a QTL against SRS. Lately, we have also used genomic uh, selection for resistance to this disease. Another example is Flavobacterium psychrophilium, or Flavo, as we call it, in the Chilean and uh, British hatcheries. Uh, it's a big problem there, but not so much in, in Norway. And the problem is that the bacterium has developed uh, resist resistance to the antibiotics. Aquagen has again found a very strong QTL for Flavo, uh, uh, both in salmon and in rainbow trout. Um, and this facilitates selection for resistance. Uh, so this is an example of a very strong QTL in salmon, but we see that there is even more to gain from using genomic selection in addition. So Aquagen also develops salmon resistance to other bacterial diseases and for disease resistance in other species that we have breeding programs for. Oh, sorry, I think I, did I lose one? Uh, yeah, so on the other hand, uh, so away from the bacterial diseases, but over to the viral diseases and parasites, uh, they cause great losses for the salmon farming industry every year. Um, the Norwegian Veterinary Institute, they publish an overview of fish health issues uh, in the Norwegian fish farming industry every year. And the 2019 report shows that the top 10 issues affecting survival and welfare in Norwegian salmon farms, uh, of those top 10, um, three are caused by viruses and two by salmon lice, so a, a parasite. Um, the viral disease infectious uh, pancreas necrosis, an IPN, uh, was not on the Veterinary Institute's list. And the main reason is shown here. Um, Aquagen discovered a powerful genetic marker or a QTL for resistance to IPN in 2007. And since the implementation of uh, the, the IPN QTL in our egg production in 2009, the number of outbreaks of this viral disease uh, in the orange line here, um, has been reduced by about 90%, while the salmon production has doubled uh, in the same period in the blue bars. But one vi uh, viral disease that was on the list is pancreas disease, or PD. Um, the green line shows that we can reach 20% uh, relative percent survival, or RPS. Uh, when we select for one uh, genetic marker or QTL. Uh, but we know that there are many uh, genetic markers that contribute to PD resistance. And the blue line shows that if we use all the relevant uh, gene markers when we select for PD resistance uh, and use genomic selection, we can achieve a much higher protection than only with marker assisted selection. So these were only some examples of how Aquagen works with uh, salmonid viral diseases and diseases that don't have alternative treatments. Uh, to sum up, uh, Aquagen has breeding programs for several species and we select for growth, disease resistance and fillet uh, yield and quality in a balanced way. Uh, the antibiotics usage uh, is not a problem in Norwegian fish farming. Uh, selective breeding is a very strong tool against salmon, bacterial, viral and parasitic diseases. Also when there are no vaccines or antibiotic resistance has been developed. 
uh, and we see that there is a lot to gain from selective breeding for salmon health and welfare. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Trina. Uh, uh, thank you very much for these examples from the aquaculture sector, breeding sector. I uh, will introduce uh, the next speaker, Lars Peter Sorensen, who is speaking Danish, Danish at the beginning, beginning <laughs> to try to change his, his name. So Lars Peter is working in Viking genetics. Uh, he is the genetic development manager at Viking, Viking Genetics, where he's responsible for developing and carrying breeding plans for selecting selections of bulls. He has a PhD in quantitative genetics and in mastitis resistance, which is the topic today. Uh, until 2015, he worked as a researcher in various projects and after has specialist in genomic breeding value estimation. He's going to explain you what is this. I hope that you can unmute, Lars. I'm here, yeah. I hope you okay, can hear me. perfect. <laughs> now you, are, you have the right name. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, and I will uh, try to speak uh, English this, this time. So uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, everybody. I will just uh, share my presentation. Uh, yeah. And then it's I coming. Full screen. Yeah, full screen now. I hope. Yeah. And I just have to swap screens here. How yes. does that look? Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, I have called my uh, presentation 40 years of breeding for improved disease resistance in dairy cattle, but actually this is not going to be a hi historical uh, lessons, but it, it's more about the uh, uh, what we have been uh, been doing in in the Nordic countries uh, during uh, many many years, uh, and when I uh, talk about the Nordic countries here, I mean uh, Denmark, uh, Sweden, and Finland, uh, which are the countries where we uh, sort of uh, call uh, our home base. But uh, I think what is uh, uh, quite characteristical of the Nordic countries is that we have a very strict legislation regarding uh, treatment of uh, farm animals. Actually, it's only within the last uh, 10 to 12, 15 years that uh, farmers have uh, been allowed to treat animals themselves. Uh, uh, before that, it was required that an animal uh, was treated by a vet. Uh, but today it is possible for farmers to, uh, to have what we call health agreement schemes uh, which uh, permits the farmers to treat uh, uh, some diseases uh, themselves. And of course that is uh, uh, important because then you can do treatment faster and, and hopefully also a, a bit, bit cheaper. Uh, also, uh, I think we can say that we have very high management level uh, uh, in our dairy sector. You know, on our dairy farms, uh, we have very high producing cows and uh, if you, uh, as you may know, uh, well, if a cow uh, should produce a lot of milk, it needs to be a healthy animal uh, and uh, not being a sick animal. And then uh, I think for many years we have done selective breeding for improved uh, animal health. Uh, and uh, I've written uh, three, uh, um, uh, well, uh, diseases here. One is otter health, uh, related to otter health, uh, which is the oldest one, uh, almost uh, 40 years. And the second one is uh, craw health. And then we also uh, do selective breeding for metallic, metabolic and reproductive uh, disorders. So uh, I think the result is uh, quite clear when you look at these, uh, this figure here. Uh, I should say it is from 2015. I know there exist uh, figures from 2018, but I would assume that they look uh, uh, quite similar to this one. Uh, so I think it is quite clear that what we are doing in the Nordic countries uh, has a, a clear effect on the use of uh, uh, antibiotics uh, in the animal uh, sector. <clears throat> um, also, uh, we uh, use what we call a balanced uh, breeding goal in, in the dairy cattle breeding in the Nordic countries. Uh, we have a you can say uh, a total merit index, it's called NTM or Nordic total merit. 
uh, and it uh, comprises uh, a lot of different traits. Uh, but uh, if you look at the cow picture, you can see that uh, approximately 30% of, uh, of the total breeding value is dedicated to production. So that would be milk and, and, uh, and meat. And around 53% is dedicated to animal health and reproduction. So actually breeding for improved animal health and improved uh, fertility. And then only 17% is, uh, is uh, dedicated to uh, confirmation. Uh, how does the animal uh, look like? And when I talk about balance, uh, it is because all traits that are included in NTM, so that would be 90 plus trait in 14 trait groups, uh, they have an economic value. So if an, a farmer can improve this uh, trait, he will uh, gain a certain amount of money. So um, I will use uh, auto health here as a, as a case just to show what breeding can do and what uh, the right strategy against a disease uh, can, can do uh, over many years. Um, other health has been uh, the focus uh, in uh, dairy cattle breeding for, uh, well, since the beginning of the 80s in the Nordic countries, uh, it is characterized by having a low herdability. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, it means that uh, what you see regarding the phenotype can be explained by 40% uh, uh, explained by the genes of the cow and 90% of the uh, environment. Uh, how is the bedding? Uh, how is the animal uh, treated? How uh, uh, is the climate? Uh, is the weather hot and all kind of stuff? Uh, so uh, it has a low heritability of only 4%. Uh, as comparison, milk yield is around 30%. Uh, but despite a low heritability, it is possible to uh, improve this trait uh, through uh, breeding. Uh, also, uh, what uh, we should notice here is that uh, mastitis, uh, you can say auto health and milk yield, uh, they are unfavorable correlated. So that means if you breed for uh, higher milk yield, uh, you will also see uh, uh, more uh, cases of mastitis. Uh, but it has, is actually possible through balanced breeding and to improve both traits. So you can just, perhaps you need only 70% uh, improvement in yield uh, and not 100%. Uh, so you will still have uh, progress uh, in both, uh, both uh, traits. And then on the following uh, slides, I will, uh, uh, let you take a look on genetic trend and I will explain what that is and also the effect of uh, selective breeding. And then I uh, uh, lastly will give you an example of uh, direct versus indirect uh, selection uh, for uh, a certain trait. So uh, this is just a uh, overview of the genetic trend. Uh, uh, so that means improvement in breeding values uh, from, this is from year 2000 until uh, 2019, so uh, around 20 years. Uh, and what we can see here is that we have uh, an improvement in, in auto health, uh, breeding values for auto health of around uh, 20 index uh, units. And at the same time, we also have uh, uh, about the same improvement, perhaps a bit more uh, in, uh, in yield or milk yield. Uh, so there are improvements in, in both uh, traits. Um, so um, if you um, see, okay, what does that mean? If you look at uh, cases of mastitis, 20 index units, how much is that? It is act can actually be shown that it is around uh, 5.4 uh, cases of mastitis of, well, 4.4% units less mastitis uh, uh, since, uh, since year 2000 until till now. So it is, uh, uh, in our eyes, a very large effect uh, through breeding. And what is, uh, we, we need to remember is that what you change during genetics is permanent and it is cumulative. Uh, and as I said here, uh, the difference between uh, 2001 19, and 19 is 20 units, and that is uh, more or less equal to 5.4% units less uh, mastitis. Uh, and what is, uh, you can also look at the breeding values uh, of uh, bulls, for example, uh, a breeding value of 100 is uh, 
an average uh, and being value below 100 is uh, uh, below average and above average is uh, uh, more than 100. So uh, of course we would like to have uh, bulls with a breeding value for other health above 100. And also uh, the red numbers here just show the proportion of uh, daughters of these bull, bulls with mastitis. Um, so you can say if you have a bull with a breeding value of 80, 17.4% of the daughters will have mastitis. And if you have one with 120, it's only 6.6%. And this is purely explained by, by breeding uh, and no, not environment in this case. Uh, and this uh, is just an overview of, uh, of what we have seen over the years. Uh, you have the graphs uh, on, on the left side here is just the number of treatments per 100 cows in 2008. So that would be the blue bars and 2018, that would be the green bars. And this is in Danish Holstein. And it is uh, shown per lactation. The first four bars is in uh, um, first lactation. It's divided into two periods, an early period and a late period. And then you have a uh, second and third lactation also. And as you can see here, the number of uh, treatments goes up as the uh, lactation number uh, goes up. But if you look at the difference between these, uh, the number of treatments in 2008 and 2008 and try to convert that into uh, used antibiotics uh, and uh, also into uh, non-wasted milk, you get the numbers on the right in red here. So it can actually be shown that um, just the difference between these numbers uh, can be converted into 4.3 ton of antibiotics that has not been used. Uh, so I, I think uh, combined breeding and uh, better management uh, has had a very clear effect on the use of antibiotics in the Nordic countries uh, or in Denmark in this case. But also uh, when you have less sick cows, uh, you don't have a need to discard the milk because of uh, antibiotics. And so you can actually say that will save us around 17.2 million kilos of milk on population basis. Uh, this is around 325,000 cows. Uh, and also uh, when a cow uh, gets mastitis, it will have a permanent uh, milk loss because part of the uh, milk producing cells uh, is, is destroy are, are destroyed. And that will uh, also uh, give us around 55 million kilos of milk. So, so in total, what is this, uh, 17, uh, 72, million kilos of milk that uh, that we can actually sell to the dairy company and use for consumption. So uh, quite a large effect in, in my eyes at least. So uh, lastly, we uh, uh, have something around direct and indirect selection. And this is where it uh, we, uh, we call it the Nordic situation that uh, what is special about the Nordic countries is that we have direct reg registrations on memory treatments. And we have had that uh, since the early 80s uh, because it is mandatory uh, to put it into a database when an animal has been uh, treated with antibiotics. And this is what we use in, uh, in breeding or selective breeding for, for improved auto health. Uh, on top of that, we also have some indirect measures of auto health that would be a uh, somatic cell count uh, in the milk and then a two confirmation trait called four order attachment and order death. Uh, however, the advantage of direct recordings uh, is a higher reliability of the breeding values. Uh, and that again mean that you can have uh, an increased uh, genetic progress uh, compared to having only indirect measures. And then uh, of course, uh, order health is weighted according to actual costs. Uh, and the result of that is a balanced uh, breeding goal. So you can say uh, a key to success when you uh, will have, uh, or when you look for uh, genetic improvement uh, in disease traits is to have uh, a lot of data and very good data uh, also. So um, what are the effects of improving auto health in dairy cattle? Uh, why should you care about that? Um, well. Of course, uh, first most, uh, fewer treatments uh, mean that you will use less antibiotics. And um, when you use less antibiotics, you also uh, decrease the risk of, uh, of uh, 
uh, what you call it, uh, resist, resistant uh, bacteria, uh, of course. And then uh, because of the lower use of antibiotics, you have, uh, you can say you get better food safety, less chance of antibiotics in, in the food or in the milk. Uh, you will have less discarded milk and you will have better milk quality. So that is uh, more money for, for the farmer. And then of course you will have improved animal welfare. Uh, mastitis uh, causes uh, uh, pain and swelling and uh, decreased eating, uh, feed intake and, and other, other kinds of, of nasty things. And of course you can avoid that by not having the disease. So, uh, and the animal will, uh, uh, will react on that in producing uh, more milk. And um, what we see when we have fewer uh, treatments of mastitis, we get improved longevity of the cows. Uh, so that means uh, that the cows uh, will live longer. Uh, so we don't need as many heifers uh, uh, for replacement. Um, so what do you do? Uh, because we know that a cow should have a calf every year. Uh, so instead you will inseminate the uh, cows with beef semen and beef semen uh, will uh, create a beef cross, which is, uh, you can say, better for the environment because they grow faster and they have better uh, feed efficiency. So uh, also because of fewer mastitis treatments, you will actually lower the environmental and climatic impact uh, from the dairy cattle sector. And then not the least, uh, what uh, is also very important is improved economy uh, for the herd owner. Thank you very much. That was what I was going to say. Thank you very much. Um, so we are a bit late, so I will give the floor uh, to um, Dick. Jan, did you, are you there somewhere? Can you? Uh, you are <laughs> good. <laughs> I hope you're still good. Hear me. I'm just going to share the screen to introduce you, if you, if I may. Uh, so our researcher, I mean, we have a lot of scientists today, but we have the last one is still working in the university. <laughs> it is you. So Dick Yan is in, uh, working, uh, he's a professor, sorry, and researcher at the Swedish University of Agricultural Science. Dick Yan is also involved in animal tax forces uh, representing Sweden uh, in the annual general meeting. Um, he research focus uh, in bone weakness in lion hands, and I'm not going to say any more as you have seen. Uh, I give you the floor because we are running a little bit out of time, and I think the panel discussion is also important. So I give you the floor, and uh, yes, and just stop sharing the screen to allow you to share your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's see if I can get this to. Uh, launch. Yep, that should be okay. Um, so it's my great oh, pleasure to perfect. talk to you about breeding better bones using genomics to improve health in laying hands. And I'll start with the take home message is that genetic improvement of bone health at farm level will require evaluations at farm level across systems. So avian osteoporosis or bone weakness in laying hands is remarkably different from that we talked earlier about in um, broilers. Um, and it's a major welfare issue that we've known about for some time. Um, and the reason we maybe don't hear more about it is that it is quite uh, prevalent across all systems, whether we are in barn systems, cages, enriched cages, or free range. We have a very large proportion of laying hands that show bone damage at the end of lay. And with an EU flock of more than 350 million hands, we clearly have a, a challenge on our hands. So uh, a quick reminder what Anna-Marie already showed for broilers, it's very much a um, large breeding pyramid where the breeding company maintains pure lines where the genetic improvement happens. And then we have grandparent parent lines and you know, tens of uh, pure line birds results literally in millions of laying hands that account for tens of millions of 
eggs. So, um, and already early on, colleagues at Rostin um, started to collaborate with Lohmann Tierzucht then in Germany and take birds from their breeding line and see if they could select for high or low bone strength. And that was uh, published in 2000. And it showed a pretty good heritability around 40%. And we recently, like recently as last week, um, published a um, heritability and correlation analysis of two of these purebred lines and still those uh, heritabilities around 35-40% for bone health related traits is still uh, in this very day. Um, of course, when you have these selection lines, you can make nice crosses and try to map QTLs initially uh, that um, are divergently selected in these crosses and eventually um, originally were segregating in the pure line. And uh, these ones were first mapped in 2007. And last year for this QTL, we actually are pretty certain we've got the causal gene after a few years of very hard work across very many institutes. Um, so in this HFG was, of course, we can uh, look also there. So here we've looked at a pure line in the top of the breeding pyramid, where we looked at around 750 top and tail birds from 2000 that were uh, phenotyped. And we find, as we see, clear evidence for QTL across a number of chromosomes. So we have a good heritability and we can find genomic regions that have an effect. So we can select in these pure lines using either phenotyping or using markers for improved bone strength. Um, but really, once you've got this QTL, that's really nice. You can write papers, which is important for people like me, but we really wanted to know what does it really mean? So yes, we found QTLs here in the pure lines. What do they actually mean in the commercial layers that we can use or buy at the farms? So that was really the, the research question we had originally. What do these SNPs that we have found in the breeding lines mean in commercial crossbred layers? And we looked at two breeds, uh, two uh, commercial um, lines. And we wanted to see uh, if there's a difference in housing regime. So we had in our experimental farm at SLU enriched cages and floor pens. We, uh, there's an idea that uh, supplementation with organic zinc might help both the eggshell and the bone quality. So we wanted to look at that and we studied the effect on feather score. So the overall uh, appearance of the bird. So we, uh, the end of lay out of uh, a full barn with three and a half thousand uh, layers, we picked thousands at 100 weeks. So that's an extended uh, age at lay. So we had a longer laying period. And of the birds that were still in lay, we took bone measurements. And in first instance, we took the significant SNPs that we detected earlier in the genome-wide association study, plus some known QTL for bone strength from the literature. And we typed those and we followed that up because we had all the phenotypes and material with a genome-wide analysis. Um, first of all, if we look here at the, uh, the effects, so there is a uh, clear effect whether birds are in cages or in pens. On the left, we see the relationship between body weight and bone strength, breaking strength of the tibial bone, the leg bone. And we see in layers that heavier birds have slightly stronger legs, which is really not such a surprise. Uh, we see very little uh, difference between the breeding companies, bovans or lovan selected leghorn. Um, but we see that in um, pen, there is a stronger increase with body weight. So there is the, the relationship between body weight and 
bone strength is stronger and on average birds did have stronger bones in the floor system which which arguably you could correlate with their movement so when we moved to the candidate snips we were in for a bit of a surprise um, so here you see all the 111 snips that we initially tested and um, we here have their logged p-value so bigger is better uh, that we got from those snips in the um, floor system the pens uh, as compared to the same snips but their uh, beef logged p value in the cage systems and we see actually that some snips where we got some evidence for an effect in the cage system showed absolutely no effect in the pen and the same here there's extremely little uh, concordance there between the two systems and that was partly like okay were we just unlucky with these snips or is there something more fundamental going on so that was one reason why we continued with all the SNPs and to sort of as a um, health check because we had the data anyway we wanted to compare that to a much more thoroughly studied trait like body weight that we have so many other studies um, and so here on the left side you see three Manhattan plots or Holland plots by the way they look for bone strength and on the right you see exactly the same birds for uh, more like a standard weight for a standard trait like body weight and you see that uh, this is the the top picture is for uh, the caged birds the second level is for the birds in the floor system and the bottom one is when we put all the birds together um, and uh, as, you, as we see for bone strength we really get no very no consistent signals whatsoever but if we look in exactly the same birds for body weight we see we find similar regions and if we put those together we get really quite strong evidence including some uh, usual suspects like the body weight QTL on chromosome 4. Um, to look at that a bit more if we look at the actual estimate so if we look at the um, effects for the breaking strengths this is the the p values again but this is for the the most significant snips either in pen or in cage so from the the whole genome and again we see very little concordance and likewise for the effects there's no really any concordance between the estimated marker effects Whereas for body weight, as in the previous picture, we get reasonable concordance or pretty good concordance for significance and likewise for estimated effects. So um, what we have learned so far is that uh, we can find SNPs in pure lines, but it's very hard to replicate those in commercial birds. Um, and that's where our newest project comes in, which we've only just started and which is inspired by a European cost action which is the keel bone damage project and our new project is called keel bone tools and has primarily Swedish funding so uh, when we talk about bone damage I've been talking to you about measuring tibia legs uh, we study the tibia because it's an easy straightforward phenotype we get good heritabilities and we expect good correlations with keel bone damage because keel bone damage is actually where it happens in layer that is one of the main problems where we see problems it's in the keel bones the breast bones of the bird but so far keel bone is really lacking a good phenotype we're not getting what is there the palpations they, that we have at the moment they do not give very good heritabilities so x-ray to the rescue colleagues in the keel bone damage consortium have developed uh, x-ray as a way to uh, have a better more uh, reliable method to assess keel bone fractures and more reproducible using x-rays 
and our colleague Ian Dunn at the Ruslin has been uh, a US has had a US funded project to again look at low mount birds and high sex birds, high line birds to look at uh, to follow bone strength over time in the pure lines. So again, we have the, the FFR project looking in the pure lines. And so here in Sweden, we are following up in the layers and we will target a commercial farm. So we will really work at a commercial farm and follow hands of laying hands over time. Um, the project has multiple layers. First of all, we want to implement the X-ray as a routine monitoring tool for keel bone damage in Sweden. Um, we want to see if it could provide crossbred information for purebred selection. And as part of that, we're also hoping to get underway using um, robot vision or artificial intelligence or whatever fancy buzzword you'd like to use to get those x-rays uh, scored automatically. And uh, because in this way, we will really hopefully to make a re real difference here at the top of the pyramid in selection, we are going to need a lot of good information here from the commercial layers. And that was my take home message to start with. Um, this work is hugely international with lots of colleagues from SLU, Roslin, Uppsala University, University of Granada, Lohmann Tierzucht, several colleagues in the keel bone damage cost action and a lot of organizations that contributed funding. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, before Chara is going to conduct the panel discussion, don't forget to ask your questions in the chat. But before this, I'm going to share once more my screen to submit you a slide of poll um, on the role that you think that uh, animal breeding can play for animal health and welfare. So again, you have the QR code, you have the code to join in Slido and there's a statement if you agree, strongly agree or disagree about the fact that animal breeding programs can achieve significant progress in increasing animal robustness, thus decreasing many animal health and welfare related issues. So uh, Chala should be on mute now and should join us with Miguel Angel Higuera. Miguel Angel, are you with us? Yes, me here. Hello, Good. Anna. Hello. Good afternoon. And Chara should go somewhere. Yes. yes, I'm here. Okay, so you have also, so I'm going to stop sharing the screen to see you. Uh, the speakers can open their cameras and I'm going to stop sharing the screen. The Slido link is also in the chat. Yes. So, uh, well, we are a little bit over our time, so I will be I will try to be quick, but first I would like to give you the floor, Miguel, and get your uh, ideas about the role of animal breeding, especially for animal health and welfare uh, from a farming uh, society perspective, from the supply chain perspective. Yes, yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much and good afternoon, everyone. And also thank you, of course, for the, for the invitation for Copa Coyeca to participate in this, in this event. And also I would like to congratulate for the speaker, it will be a, fan, a fantastic talk. So, and also I think the debate is going to be very, very good also later on. Uh, Copa Coyeca, as you know, we are the, the European producers and, and, and the European cooperatives. And, and also I'm here as the chairman of the Working Party of Animal Health and, and Welfare. And also for farmers, uh, the, the breeding and selection of animals is real, real, a, a crucial for the develop of the livestock sector. So, and also not, not only for the livestock sector, we would like to say that the livestock sector is in the rural, rural areas, so for the rural economy and also for the, for the food supply for the consumers. So, so this is quite, quite important. Regarding the relation between the farmers and the, and the breeders and also the, the genetic improvements, 
we have, I think, three or four important issues. One of them is, of course, the competitiveness. It's clear that the development of the breeding animals have a direct impact on the productivity, productions, and also in the sustainability because more efficient animals use less resources and also produce less emissions. So that's is online to try to reduce our cost of production on so the environmental impact. The health is very important and also the speaker has speak a lot about the, the health and the relation between the health and the, and the animal welfare. Of course, from the health, the most important for us is to try to develop more robust animals and try to prevent the disease and also uh, uh, tackle the, the antimicrobial resistance. Uh, it's one of our priorities. Also, Copa Cogeca is, is working in a, in a European project called, called DISAR, Dissemination of Innovation Alternative Against Antimicrobial Resistance, in what we have detected what one of our pillars to try to develop against the antimicrobial resistance, of course, is the breeding and the, and the genetic. I also would like to invite you to know more things about this project. This is a website that is www.projectdesign. And also we have a community of practice in Facebook where all the farmers, veterinarian and advisor are together to, to share comments and also to, to, share, to share good practice. Another issue that is important for us is animal welfare. So stronger animals also are, and, and, and the susceptibility to the disease are, are reducing. With, we, we try to select better and improve the, the animals. And also, as one of the speakers said, the behavior of the animal, the selection to a correct behavior and also the relations in between the human and the animals increase the animal welfare by reducing of the, of the stress. The impact of the environment less and better use of the resources and also reduction of the emissions is absolutely in line with the breeding sector and the, and the farmers. And for us also there are another important things that is the, the reproductive te technologies and how we can bring all this develop in your site, in the breeding site, to the all the farmers as soon as, as soon as possible. So I think and I fully agree with the title of the, of the events that for us the healthy and, and happy animal for sustainable societies is, is one of our pillars, of course. I'm very, very glad to be here with you and also very glad to, to join to the speaker with the, with the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. So um, now I would like to ask our speakers to open their video cameras so that uh, the audience can also see them because I have a question for uh, all of you. Um, first, I will start with Christian. Um, I can yes. Well, Christian, we had uh, some similar comments since we are uh, uh, the representative organization of the breeding organizations. Uh, our members are uh, quite uh, um, curious about how the new uh, legislation on animal health and welfare would uh, apply to the use of gene editing technology, which could also be a a very uh, important tool for the uh, animal health and welfare. Uh, can you comment on this? Yes and no. As I tried to say in my intervention, we need a future-proof legislation. And whatever is part of future solution, the legislation should not hamper it. It should enable it and encourage it. So in that sense, but it's still early days. We're in a reflection phase now, as I mentioned, this fitness check the assessment is ongoing, the scientific evidence is being piled up, and there are more sources to draw from than just science, as someone pointed out in the chat. So it's really a period of reflection for the moment. But again, the objective is to have a uh, legislation which allows for future solutions, technology and others, to be used and not hampered. It. That's all I can say now. It's still early days for us in that sense. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Anne-Marie, um, we had uh, received a question about how Aviagen could define well the welfare the independent of uh, health. Um, can you maybe give us some more um, examples of how you uh, see the welfare in Aviagen? You are muted. Uh, thank you, Chella. So thank you for that question. And I would like to look along also the question from Marie-Hélène Pinard, who asked whether we, there's also positive welfare to look at. Yes. So 
uh, when you look at, at, at uh, breeding, then many traits, you breed them in conjunction. So we breed, then we look at improvements per population. That is a dedicated breeding goal per population. And then at every moment there are birds measured and placed and selected, that is ongoing. So apart from the improvements of the support system, which is better health and lungs, leg strength, food, joints and foot pads, you can look at other uh, uh, traits. So gait is, is, has much improved. So that my question is this, then that more welfare than health, that is for uh, the public to decide maybe. Uh, then uh, we breed them in various, uh, uh, various and we have the brothers and sisters in other environments. That means that there are better, the birds have better options so their bodies can act to a range of situations that make them more robust. That could be situations like uh, if the weather changes, if, if, the, if there's other, uh, other feed, other circumstances, so they can, they can, they're just ready to go also when the situation changes. Is that welfare improvement? Well, that is, I'm, in my mind, as a welfare improvement. Then on top of that, we investigate and we measure behavior at various levels, so we search on the pedigree birds and on the crossbreed birds on our trial farms. And from this package, we act at various levels. So we have been doing investigation on uh, mating behavior or on feeding behavior. So the feeding behavior you can find in peer reviewed journal articles, and there's a big difference in feeding behavior. However, you know, so this, the, and, and the, it, it can be heritable and vary in a population, but we also need to think then what is the consequence of a change in a population. So we've been discussing a change in feeding behavior, you know, what would that mean for the options of the future populations? So all the options are there across the birds, birds eating quick, birds eating slow, wood, uh, who hang around the fridge at night, all these things. If you take away these options, then you might take away the option for the future. So we have been investigating that and decided to do not work on that. Mating behavior is a very in interesting one that we are now investigating and putting into practice in our pedigree program, how the male and the females interact and which males and females and the hierarchies in between. Uh, and that is all very interesting. So that is already part of the breeding program. And then you have uh, what you call behavior traits. So we look at behavior traits at all levels in the pedigrees, but also at our crossbreed birds and all our trials, we, we measure behavior that is uh, looked at also by uh, Wageningen University scientists who check often what we do and so that we fine tune that we always do the right thing. And based on that, uh, we can see how the populations develop. But even there, you can see it, there should be a balance in the options and the way birds behave. And, and that is something, well, this is one of the huge interesting things we always discuss and, and that is very interesting. There was also another, uh, in other way that we had slow colored birds, slow growing and well, they like to be inside. So then um, the customer said, yes, but if I want to have the slow growing birds, I want them to go outside. So then you have an option to, to, to have some of the birds, the brothers and the system to see how, how likely they go outside and the ones who like to go outside more quickly or more easily who like the rain or the Scottish the Scottish weather to breed to breed these in preference over the ones who say, "Why well, I'd rather sit inside." So this is is this giving you an answer on how we investigate welfare and health and as a package of the whole? Yes, but uh, yeah, if 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 our audience also has uh, more questions, they can of course write it in the question and answer part. Thank you, Anne Marie, for the <laughs> detailed explanation. Uh, Stephanie, we have also a question for you. Um, are you considering health and welfare a result of the other factors in your approach, which you uh, presented today? Yes, we do. Truly, we do. Well, um, I think my presentation was also mainly based on social behavior. Yes, that is true. But uh, yeah, at the same time, we also take consideration of, of health and uh, of these animals. My, the necrosis was one part of it, but we have truly some more um, yeah, breeding traits we are using for better health and sustainability. Um, yeah, for example, we use the CT scan in Delta Norway and Delta Canada to select against osteochondrosis. Uh, we breed for birth resistance in our tempo line. 
and uh, for sure for more um, better survival of the piglets, robustness, and sure for, for better mother abilities. For example, there are way more traits we are working on, yes. Yes, okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, Trina, you had a, a quite interesting uh, presentation. Well, uh, especially our audience was a little bit fascinated about the improvements in the aquaculture breeding. Um, so, um, are you extending your efforts towards the investigation of further welfare improvement in the aquaculture species? Can you give us some more explanation about that? Yes, um, th uh, thank you. I, I see now the, the questions in the chat, but I wasn't looking <laughs> while the other um, talks were ongoing. Um, yes, I mean, the, the given topic was about disease resistance, so that's what I focused on, but, um, but uh, yes, welfare, in a more kind of wide uh, welfare definition uh, needs to be taken into account. So. Um, for example, uh, with regards to um, deformities, there are there that is a, a welfare issue in, in uh, sa salmonid uh, production. Uh, in our breeding nucleus, we take out uh, animals with uh, with deformities, so that's one thing we do. But uh, but it's also right. Um, uh, what is said about uh, the, there not being very clear welfare um, indicators. That, that's something that is very kind of uh, an ongoing research on, on what uh, the, the industry as a whole regards as, as good welfare indicators for, uh, for a salmon. But it's of course something that we're following closely and that we're implementing in our breeding program as uh, as much as we can. Um, and yes, we measure a lot <laughs> and, and register a lot. So mm. I don't know if that really answered your question. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, Egbert just posed another question. If we can extend these successes in fish disease breeding to mammals, but um, would you like to respond to that or maybe our Me? others? <laughs> I don't think I should know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Um, so Lars, Peter, um, you provided us with very uh, interesting facts and uh, figures. And uh, well, there is a question already you answered, but maybe some of us have uh, missed it. Have you observed any beneficial impact from other health improvement on fewer incidents of metabolic diseases, low health or fertility disorders? Well, uh, it's an interesting uh thought i think and i i, I believe that uh, perhaps you should be able to uh, observe something if if you look close enough uh you know when a when a cow has pastitis it is sick uh, and it does not eat well but it still produces uh, somehow so so you could think that it, it could lead to uh other diseases uh, uh especially metabolic diseases but i i don't really uh, i don't remember the what the correlation is uh, to, to claw health, uh, but and I can't really see why improving mastitis should improve claw health as well. That may be a small genetic correlation, but, but I, I don't recall that it is uh, large at least. Uh, perhaps uh, someone else here uh, uh, knows it uh, better by heart, but I, of course I can in investigate that. And it really doesn't matter because we are, uh, we have also included the uh, uh, Breeding values for, for claw health and metabolic diseases in our uh, total merit index. So it, it uh, we use direct data, so to speak, instead. Yes, yes, I understand. Okay, thank you very much. And um, question for uh, Dirk Jan. Uh, well, what about the effect of bone strength on broiler and egg production interaction with the heat stress as an environmental factor? Um, Wow, uh, thank you, I think. Uh, so bone problems in broilers, I think, is, is quite a different uh, challenge to bone problems in, in laying hands, given that in laying hands we're talking, we're talking about problems that become an issue once they are, you know, reproducing. And in broilers, it's, it's often a problem of uh, 
maturation, it's ossification of the bone and it's the, the joints and it's related to, to excess weight. So I think they're quite different, but we have actually uh, applied for money to um, study them both and to, um, to, to, buy, to, uh, to buy broiler chicks and layer chicks and keep them in very um, different regimes. So to put some on sort of an exercise regime uh, and some on a couch potato regime uh, as, as young chicks to see and then monitor their activity with uh, uh, current technology that we have now uh, in, in various places where we can, can you know, follow the, the, the amount individual birds exercise. So we, we have thought about that. I haven't thought about uh, adding heat stress as another um, challenge, but that's partly because we're, we're maybe not in the right country for that. <laughs> That's true. The, the question was posed from uh, Cairo University. Yes. Uh, yeah, I know Mustafa is very interested in, uh, in heat stress and uh, getting... And maybe it's still process. relevant under the climate uh, change, though. For sure. <laughs> because I come from a broiler breeding company. Because I think, despite what is said as a remark in the EFSA report, where the data which were given were not taken into account because they were not in peer-reviewed journals, which is okay, we can accept that. We have just shown that the welfare by breeding has been so demonstrably and so gigantically improved. But of course, we will continue to work on it. And also the projects that, that Dirk Jan is doing, which are more sh showing behavior on, on various past, uh, ways of, of using of, of the legs, that is also very interesting. And when it comes to heat stress or to uh, producing and being good and having good legs in hot environments. That is indeed also focus of some of the breeding programs uh, so that birds can perform well in hot and in, in cold environments. So that might be an answer to the colleague from Cairo. Yes, thank you, Anne-Marie. Uh, Trina, have you raised your hand? Well, yeah, I, I, I did uh, think a bit about that last question you had. Um, and, and I, I see that there's a lot of interesting comments in the chat that, of course, the, the reason that we do get such a, a quick response or, or rapid improvements in, in the fish is that uh, there is still a lot of genetic variation there. Uh, I think that the, the, the time extent of how long you've been breeding these different animals uh, uh, makes some of the genetic variation uh, fixed in, in your population. So for, for the fish and the salmon maybe in particular, there's, a, there's still a lot of genetic variation. And that's why we find these QTLs. And, um, but the, 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 the direction that the breeding programs are going in is more towards genomic uh, selection. So, so we take into account all the genetic variation there. And yes, there's also number games. I mean, one female uh, salmon will spawn about 15,000 eggs. So there's a lot, <laughs> lot of uh, animals to do registrations on and get good statistics and yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but how transferable that is, uh, it's uh, very difficult to say. Yes, I think it, we will see it in time, uh, how we can uh, use these information and knowledge interspecies uh, breeding programs. Thank you very much. Well, uh, unfortunately, we don't have more time. Uh, otherwise, I had written a whole page of questions for each of you. Um, but I have to give the floor to Roland so that we can sum up. And um, thank you very much for all the contributions you have done. Yes, thanks for handing over to me, Jala. Um, I was asked to conclude uh, at the end of this webinar this Breeders Talk Green second webinar jointly organized by FAP and uh, Fabre TB. Uh, being a senior member of the FAP steering committee, I would like to start with giving great thanks to the present presenters. So we had six outstanding presentations by six excellent speakers. We covered farm to fork, broiler production, pig production, aquaculture with a focus on salmon production, dairy cows and layers. So we covered a whole range of livestock and aquaculture production. 
Uh, without going into details, I think it was worthwhile joining this webinar and uh, demonstrating the efforts of breeding companies and breeding organizations regarding improvement of sustainability, animal welfare, and disease resistance. And I say this with a specific focus on the role of breeding organizations being a cornerstone in the supply chain. It starts with the breeders, it goes via the multipliers and producers to the processors, to the retailers, and finally to the consumers. So we should not stop communicating to the public uh, what our work is ongoing and doing. But we also need uh, funding and we need the role of science in improvement for animal breeding. And I would also like to stress that FUP as an umbrella organization of the farm animal breeding organizations plays a vital role in representation at EU level and at international level. And we think from uh, the motion of FAP steering committee that membership within FAP is mandatory for any breeding organization. And being a member of FAP, it becomes mandatory to join for the code FABAR, uh, the sustainable commitment to responsible breeding. It's a code of good practices for the support of responsible farm animal breeding. At the end of this webinar, I would give specific thanks to the team of uh, FAP and Fabri TP. Uh, Anna, you and Jala and the whole team, you performed an excellent work in the preparation of this uh, webinar. <clears throat> so on behalf of uh, FAP and Fabri TP, I would like to thank all participants and all the speakers for joining actively this session and for all their inputs. We from the FHUB steering committee, we look forward to continue this series of webinars and we hope that you will join in for the next time. So thanks to everybody and I hand back to Anna for saying farewell to you. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. Thank you, everyone. And um, we are running out of time. So just to remind that the next session will be hosted in March. And we will talk about genome editing in animal breeding. So um, let's stay tuned uh, to our activities. Thanks again for all the participants and the nice chat uh, you were managing and uh, collaborating, in asking questions. So yeah, that's the purpose of this series. So yeah, we hope to see you later this year and uh, we will post the, the video and the summary uh, in coming days. So thanks again, all of you. And uh, yeah, have a nice afternoon. Thanks, Anna. Bye-bye to everybody. Bye-bye.